Uh, I'd just like to start by thanking Brian and Jenny and Jonathan for what they shared this morning with us. Um, it was great to hear their thoughts. It's pretty hard to believe we have been six months in, in lockdown. And I'm glad I didn't know that at the start, as you said, Brian. So um, i just like to read a couple of verses, which we've all heard before. For I received from the Lord what, it, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Um, I'd, I'd like us all this morning before we actually uh, take our emblems that we should, I hope you've all got with you this morning, just to spend a short time in um, thinking back over your week in, uh, and what's happened to you. And there might be things you might like to give the Lord thanks for. And, and there might be things that you might also at this time uh, need forgiveness for. So before we take this, I'd like us just to spend a few moments in uh, quiet reflection over the week. And then I'll pray and then we'll take these emblems together. Lord, as we um, become before you this morning and uh, we spend this time with you here, separated but together as one group, we just give you thanks for all the things you've done for us, uh, that you are the creator of this great uh, vast universe, that you came to this earth, that you were prepared to um, sacrifice yourself on the cross for us. And as we, we've been instructed, you've given us this bread, this wine, which reminds us of your body and your blood, which was shed for us. We give you thanks. And we take this in remembrance of you today. And we just give you thanks for this in your name. Amen. So, yes, we're, uh, we're welcome back to part three of our exploration of this really amazing little little story but for me there's so much in it about uh, the Jesus catching up with a woman at a well um, and just a very quick recap just to get us back in so um, Jesus was with his disciples uh, down in Judea next to the Jordan River and decided he needed to go back up to, to Galilee um, and he chose perhaps or he was forced he had to the scripture said to to go through hostile territory um through samaria and uh, and uh, at, we caught up with jesus um as he came into the town of sicha and uh, his disciples went into the town to buy some food so he went and sat down by a well and he was joined by a woman from the town um and uh, we meet them in a conversation. So Jesus has offered her living water, um, which we know means forgiveness and salvation. Um, whether or not the woman really understood it, probably not necessarily, but to her credit, she did say yes. She said, sure, what have I got to lose? I'll have some of that. For sure, let's go for it. Um, so that's where we're up to in the story, basically. Um, so now let's see, um, back to the text. And we'll, we'll see what uh, Jesus' response is to, to her uh, affirmation of, yes, I'll take that, please. So we'll bring up the slide. There we go. Um, so this is John 4, 16. And he told her, go call your husband and come back. That's kind of strange, isn't it? I mean, here he is. He's talking with her. They've had this kind of chat. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'll come in. And he's like, okay, well, let's just stop this now and, and go and get your husband and come back. And you think, well, what? <laughs> Why do you do that? Um, 
Well, we know there's two parts of the reason for that. Part of it we know is because he needed, well, he needed, he wanted to reveal uh, more about himself, um, his uh, a miraculous ability of knowledge. Um, and, and so this was his method, because he knew as the conversation was going to go. But um, it's actually not that strange a request. You know, Jesus was already kind of pushing the boundaries of acceptability here. We spoke about that last week, about um, the fact that he's talking uh, to a, not just a foreign woman or a, a somewhat un, unliked group uh, from the Samaritans, but he's, he's talking with a single woman without anyone else around. Um, and so by saying go bring your husband, he's, he's really uh, avoiding any accusations of uh, improper conduct. And, and I know that's not central to this sermon at all, this series, this passage. It's not central, but it's worth just stopping a little bit there to think about that because actually in these days, perhaps more than ever, um, it's super important for us to do what we can to avoid any potential uh, allegations of impropriety. And, and Jesus' example is great. He says, get a witness. Have someone else here so that everyone knows everything that's going on here is kosher. He might have used that word kosher, of course. Um, and so, so Jesus says, go get someone. But he didn't just say get someone, did he? He said, get your husband. Because, of, of course, Jesus knows what's going to happen. Um, and so let's have a look a little bit further at the story so we can see why Jesus said specifically for the husband. So this is John four seventeen to 18. She says, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. So most of us generally know that Jesus' first miracle is turning the water into wine. Um, but if you look at lists of, of Jesus' uh, miracles, this is often left off. But um, I think this is clearly a miracle, so a word of knowledge that's listed as a kind of miracle. Um, and what we're seeing is Jesus slowly revealing more of his identity, his divinity um, to, to the world, um, in this case through this woman. Now we know uh, his first miracle, turning water into wine, and, and that's showing his, his dominion over the natural world, that uh, Jesus himself um, can change the nature of the physical world. Um, and now we're getting to see that he has uh, special knowledge, that he has an understanding that, that couldn't be known by a normal human being. Uh, and then as we move through the story, as we go into uh, John 5, we, we see Jesus um, um, excises a demon out of someone. So with them, we're seeing that Jesus has... Um, power over the physical world. He, he has knowledge and an understanding, but he also has power in the spiritual world. He has power over spiritual beings as well. He's, he's the complete package. Um, and it's a, a gradual revelation as we go on. Now, that's not part of this series, um, the, the demon side of things, but we are seeing a, a gradual uh, revelation of, of Jesus' divinity. Um, but we're seeing something else here, which is important for this story, and we're learning something about Jesus, about his own heart. Um, as we saw in that video that we watched a couple of weeks ago, this woman was completely judged and, and shunned by her own community as, as being sinful. Um, but as Jesus, he reveals his special knowledge, and so she gets that, that he is from God. You know, she's clever enough to get that. But... Unlike other men of God um, in her town and, and so on, and perhaps people that have, have come through, um, he doesn't seem to judge her. He, he didn't tell her off. Um, he didn't preach to her. He didn't try to make her feel bad. None of that. He just spoke the truth to her. 
Now, I can't imagine the kind of impact this would have had on her. No doubt, mind-blowing. She would have been mm, confused. Uh, she would have been perhaps refreshed, um, perhaps frightened. Um, what a strange thing to have an encounter with God. And uh, it makes me wonder, how have our encounters with God been? I would guess all of this and more, in fact. Um, so the woman at the well was thrown by this. This is a man of God. She gets that. She's not that blown away by that. She is blown away by the way that he interacts with her and, and by what he does. Um, so she's confused, and, and, but she, she, she comes up with a reply. So let's have a look at, at her reply to him. So this is John 4, 19 and 20. Um, so, sir, the woman said, I, I can see that you're a prophet. I get it. You're from God. Now, she goes on a wacky tangent. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that that place where we, uh, sorry, that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. In other words, I'm just changing the subject here because I'm not going to deal with what it is that you just did. Um, and besides which, I, I really don't want to talk about me. <laughs> and I get that. I tell you what, if I meet God, when I meet God, the last thing I want to do is talk about me and to go through my life. So she deflects. And like any good deflector, she doesn't just deflect. She goes on the attack. And she said, look, here's the problem. This is the problem, you man of God. You're speaking for God. So tell me about this. God has given us this big issue. Um, God has set up his home on the top of a mountain, like all good gods do. I mean, that's just what gods did in those days. And on lots of mountaintops, you'd find temples. Um, because gods hung out on the top of mountains. That was an understanding. And, and uh, this particular god, Jehovah, was no different. He set up his temple on the top of a mountain. But Samaritan said, well, that, but that's our god. We're, we're in the land. We're not that far from there. So he's our local god. But we're not allowed to go there. What are we meant to do? This is a problem for us. And it does give us an insight into the cultural understanding and the day of the interaction between God and man. Um, and this is not something that was unique to Israel at the time. Um, it's really in the entire ancient Near East interacted with their gods the same kind of way. The, the God or the gods, depending upon your, your belief system, um, they were everywhere, um, but um, they were busy doing their thing. Um, and, and if you wanted to meet God, you had to go where God was. Um, so for followers of, of Jehovah God... Jehovah is not a real word. I've spoken about that, but it's a word that we use in English, but you know what I'm talking about. If you wanted to meet with him, you had to go to his temple, which was on top of the mountain in, in Jerusalem. Uh, look, there were synagogues. Um, it wasn't that, that the temple was the, the only place, but, but actually synagogues were more uh, places of study, more so than worship. Um, uh, they did pray there as well to some extent, um, more and more so after the destruction of the temple. Of course, everything changed. 70 AD, about 40 years after this encounter, the, the importance of the synagogues grew immensely. Prayer and worship became much more centred there because it couldn't happen in the temple anymore, of course. Um, but this woman is articulating the Samaritan's dilemma. She says, God's over there, we're over here, and we can't go over there, so we're screwed. What are you going to do about it, man of God? So Jesus says, well, I've got some good news for you. So let's have a look at that. This is John 4, 21 to 24. So, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, and we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. So Jesus is saying everything is about to change. And in fact, everything already has changed. 
He's saying, I'm not just bringing salvation for the next life. I'm bringing with me a fundamental change in the way that humans will interact with their creator. See, up to this point, it was a very transactional nature between humanity and between divinity, between God. It kind of went like this. Here's the rules, right? We've got, we've got the Torah, not just the Torah, well, not just the Ten Commandments, the, the Torah, etc. We've got all the rules. And you do the right thing, and, and, and I will give you peace and justice and prosperity. You do the wrong thing, I'll give you famine, disease, war, all of that kind of stuff. And if you do do the wrong thing and you want to try to make it right, then you need to bring a sacrifice to my altar. And even if things are kind of okay and you just want to make them better, again, sacrifice on my altar. That's the system that was in the Jewish Israelite nation and across the ancient Near East. That was the understanding of how people interacted with God. But Jesus said, I'm wrapping that up. We're going to have a whole new way of doing it. That system, finished. And as I said, of course it had to, because Jesus knew the temple was about to be destroyed in 40 years anyhow. And Jesus said, indeed it's, it's already finished, because I'm here. And now, you can come to God anytime, anywhere, because I'm changing the nature of this relationship, so that it's no longer based on rules, now it's based on love, and spirit, and truth. But there's a new kind of maturity that's required for this kind of relationship. Puppies. <laughs> we like puppies. Uh, when, when we get puppies, we have a very transactional relationship with them. When they do the wrong thing, we get a little smack on the butt. At least my puppies did. <laughs> um, if they do the right thing, we give them a, a little bit of food, usually. And we, we use that uh, as a way of controlling our relationship with them, making sure that we have a right relationship with our, with our puppies. But as, as puppies grow up and they turn into dogs, that nature changes. As the dog matures, it moves from being really transactional to more of a loving relationship where the dog does the right thing, we just give it a pat and we say something nice to it and the dog's satisfied with that. And if it does the wrong thing, we, we might just lift our voice a little bit or, or say no and the dog gets it, it knows. Now, I'm not saying we're dogs, <laughs> but I'm just kind of giving us a parallel um, with the way that the nature of relationships do change and do mature. And, and it's kind of like that with us and with God. Our relationship with him through Jesus has now changed from transactional, do the right thing, get, do the wrong thing, get, to loving bringing your spirit, connecting, relational. But Jesus didn't just bring in a new way of relating to God. He brought in a whole new understanding of who God is. He taught us by teaching the women at the well that God is spirit. Let's... What's it? It went bold. Oh, you saw that already. Okay. So we've got that. We've got the bold. God is spirit. And remember last week I said that um, God is focused on spiritual things and that the physical world is a kind of a dark, distant second. And, and I know I've said this kind of a few times in the past and I'll probably say it again in the future. Um, but here Jesus is kind of telling us why. He's saying the reason God is focused on spirit is that God is spirit. Cool. Cool. What does that mean? What does it mean to be spirit? Well, frankly, it's, it's kind of difficult for humans who are wrapped in flesh to really understand what it is to be a, a spiritual being. It's like um, trying to tell a $1 bill, $1 bill, a $1 coin, what it is to be a mountain. A coin has got some height and, and some width to it, but... But seriously, it's nothing like a mountain, and it really just can't relate to what it is, to the height and the depth and the breadth and the, the volume of a mountain. And it's kind of like that with us. We've got some spirit in us, but we live and we exist in this physical world. But 
unlike a coin, we have a mind and we can understand, um, and, and specifically Jesus says the thing we need to really understand about is our relationship with God as our worship, our connection to him, um, and, and that that is spirit-based. It's truth-based, it's love-based, it's not transactional-based anymore. And so I want to say that's, that's really one of the reasons for doing church, actually. Um, it's, at least in my mind, um, it's not, I mean, there's lots of reasons to do church. You know, there's, it's, the, the fellowship is great um, and it's good to learn about God. But ultimately for me, I think we do church to release our spirit, to get in touch with our spirit and to bring our spirit to God in worship. That's what I want more than anything. That, that's the reason why we sing songs and why we do communion and why we do prayer. These are opportunities to bring our spirit to God in worship. That's what he wants. And, and I know there's lots of distractions at the moment you know, with, with COVID, but, but frankly, even when we're all sitting in this building, there's still lots of distractions around and, and it's up to us to really to take the opportunities, to focus in on these opportunities when they're there, but also to make our own opportunities. You know, when we're at home in our bed in the morning and the night, we, we pray or um, when we're reading the Bible, we, we do it with our spirit open to God. When we, we listen to worship music in our cars or in our bedrooms or in our headphones whenever we do. And when we, we join Russell for prayer meetings on Wednesday nights or Bible studies on Tuesday morning or Tuesday afternoons, these are just all opportunities to bring our spirit to God, to worship in spirit and to have truth tied in with that at the same time. So take these opportunities when they're presented. Make your own opportunities. This is the heart here of what Jesus is bringing. He's bringing a new way of interacting He's bringing a new opportunity that, that wasn't available before, but it is available for us. And this is what God is looking for. So back to our text. So the woman, she likes what she hears. She's still a bit confused about it all, but she's like, all right. <laughs> and I get that she's confused. I mean, it's fair enough. It's, I imagine if Jesus had said all this to me and I was her, I don't think I would have really got it. It's really kind of groundbreaking stuff. So let's see what the woman says. She's kind of getting it and she's not quite there. And, and so she says this. And this is John 4.25. So the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything. The first thing I want to point out is this um, called Christ in brackets that we're seeing here. The women didn't actually say the Messiah called Christ. <laughs> that, that was added by John afterwards. So we knew who we're talking about. So the woman probably was speaking Hebrew or Aramaic and probably used something like the word Mashiach. And Mashiach is translated into English as Messiah. But um, the, the books were written, of course, in Greek. And the Greek word for the Messiah is Christos. And Christos is translated in English as Christ. So we get it. It's, it's all the same thing. The Messiah, Christos, Moshiach, Christ. We're talking about the same bloke. The point is, um, she was saying, look, this sounds great. I'm not sure I really get it. Um, but I do know that we've got a Messiah that's coming. And I know that when he comes, he'll explain it. And I'm sure I'll get it then. And we read that and go, yeah, fair enough. But the original audience reading this would have gone, what? <laughs> um, how did this woman from Samaria, these people have got such terrible theology, how, how did she even know that there was a Christ? And how would she have known that the Christ was going to explain everything? Which leads to the moment that we've all been waiting for. Da -da -da, this is John 4.26. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now, this is the first time that Jesus has actually revealed himself as the Messiah, at least as far as John's gospel goes. Now, the language here is super important. 
Because Jesus says, I am he. And this is very similar to the way God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush when he said, I am who I am. Um, and Jesus might have even used the exact same words um, because, remember, he was speaking Hebrew or Aramaic and it's recorded in Greek and so there might have been uh, some, uh, some issues in the way it was actually written down. Um, the, but the point is that he was certainly referring to that comment in the burning bush. Um, but given what the woman knew, she knew that there was a Messiah coming, we can assume she probably understood exactly what it was that Jesus was saying. And certainly we know that John's readers, they would have definitely understood the inference here. And I think it's interesting that Jesus reveals himself to different people in different ways. You see, to the disciples... They'd been with him not that long, but they'd spent a fair bit of time with him at this point. And he didn't tell them that. He, he used a different method. He said, look, hang out with me. Get to know me. Um, and he revealed himself through the things that he said and the things that he did. But this woman, Jesus knew he's got, he's got this little window of opportunity to let her know who he is. And so he just comes out and says it. Now, speaking of the disciples, here they come now. This is John 4, 27. So just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? So as I said, they haven't been with Jesus that long, but they knew enough to know not to act surprised, at least, when Jesus did something surprising. So now we get to the woman's final response. This is John 4, 28 to 30. So then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. So what happened to this woman with her encounter with God, with Jesus? She was so excited. She left her water jar behind. She ran to the town. Now this is a woman who's shunned, who's ostracized. She has to come out in the middle of the day because she can't even go out with the rest of the woman. But she's got a heart for them. She didn't just have, oh, I'm in, I'm here. I'm so, she's, hang on, let me go get the others. What, what an amazing heart. What a great first reaction. I think maybe this might be one of the reasons why Jesus came into hostile territory to see this woman in particular. And, and by doing this, Jesus had restored this woman to her community. She was no longer the woman who'd had five husbands. Now she was the woman that introduced them to the Messiah. But to really get the significance of this moment, we need to go back a little bit before the start of the story to John 3, to the last person that Jesus had a personal encounter with, and that would be Nicodemus. And he was known as the teacher of Israel. Now, we don't actually see Jesus' exact response, uh, Jesus, Nicodemus' exact response um, to meeting Jesus. But we know he certainly didn't go out, run around, tell everyone, hey, hey, I think I found the Messiah here. Um, we catch up with Nicodemus later on, and, and he's certainly still part of the ruling Sanhedrin. The best we can say about him is that... Maybe he, at least he's got an open mind that Jesus was who he said he was, but he certainly, we don't see him buying in. We don't see him getting it. But let's hope for his sake that at some point that he did. But the contrast here is, is stark. There's this righteous, learned Jewish man who, who should have known better. He had access to all the scriptures, all the, the prophecies about Jesus. And he comes away from his encounter with Jesus Skeptical at best. And yet we've got this sinful Samaritan woman who we might have thought wouldn't have a clue. Certainly the original recipients of John's um, gospel, that they would have assumed that she wouldn't have had a clue. Um, but she only knows much more than they're expecting. She gets it. And she believes. She accepts the free gift of living water and she becomes an evangelist straight away. And later on we learned that the, uh, within the town of Sichar there was many who believed. And so through the woman at the well, Jesus created his first church in Sichar. 
in hostile territory in, in Samaria. And he did it actually fairly early in his ministry. So my question for today, who are you in the story? Are you Nicodemus, the Pharisee? Is somewhat sympathetic to Jesus, not quite sure if you believe him? Are you one of the disciples, kind of standing around on the outside, watching, um, maybe even doing stuff for Jesus, but, but not actually engaging with the lost? Or are you the woman at the well, shunned by others, downcast in spirit, but ready for an encounter with Jesus and to say, yes, sure, what have I got to lose? Give me some of that living water. Or are you Jesus? Now, when I say Jesus, I don't mean actually Jesus, but I mean, are you Jesus-like? Are you following Jesus' example to actually go out and bring love and bring peace and bring forgiveness to a, a hurting and lost world? Now, my guess is, most of us watching this, we're in the disciples group. We, we're watching and we're learning. But I don't think that's why Jesus brought his disciples just to, to Sikha. I don't think he brought them there just to, to grow in understanding or to encourage them or entertain them. I think Jesus went to Sikha because he wanted his disciples, to learn how to follow him. Jesus' ministry was actually very sharply focused on creating disciples to create disciples. Jesus' plan was not for him to reach the world. His plan was to create disciples that went out and reached other disciples, that went out and reached other disciples, and so on. His plan wasn't to reach the whole world. It was to create people who would follow his example of finding new people who would find new people, and so on and so on. So as we head into our breakout rooms, I've got two questions. The first one's, I think, pretty easy. Um, I'll bring it up. First, what happened? Have we gone back to the start? Going, where are we going, boys? Okay, there we go. Thank you. Thank you for the help. <laughs> um, first one is, as I said, who are you in this story? Which of those characters do you think identifies you? Now, the second question um, may take some more thought. I hope it will, and I'm, I'm hoping that today is really just a start um, of a self-examination to answer this question because it's a biggie. And the question is, what is missing for you to become Jesus in the story? Again, I don't mean that you're going to become the saviour of the world yourself. I don't mean that you are the Messiah. That's not what I mean when I say you become Jesus. I mean, become the one who goes out of their way to bring salvation and to create disciples that will create disciples that will create disciples. That's what I mean by being Jesus. And, and I want to say, look, these are not rhetorical questions. It's not just a fun question. I really want an answer what's missing. Um, and whether it's today or tomorrow or next week or next year, if you come up with an answer, if you, if you go like, oh, you know what, this, this is missing for me, the step there, I, I really want to know because this really the heart of my job, actually, um, is to help you become more Jesus-like. That's what I want to do. So if you come up with an answer of what's missing for you, please let me know somehow or another so we can work on that together. And it's, if you do come up with something, my guess is you'll find that it's, uh, it's not just you. There are plenty of others that are in the same boat. All right, so we're going to go off into our breakout rooms now. Um, so as always, we'll do 10 minutes and have a look at those questions, and we'll see you back in a tick.